Welcome again to the Wednesday Night Bible Class with East Main Church of Christ. I'm Barry Kennedy. Glad to have you with us. Hope and trust you have your Bibles. You're ready to study God's Word together again. Here we're still in this quarantine time. Having these Bible studies online is a blessing to us, but hopefully we'll be able to one day very soon get back together in person again and have these Bible studies there at 1606 East Main Street. Can't wait for that day. Long to see everyone. Hope and trust you're doing well. Again, hope you have your Bibles. If you would, open to John chapter 4. John chapter 4 will be our text of study this evening. We're taking a few lessons from the book of John. We're jumping around a little bit through here, not going just a verse by verse study, but some principles that we see from the book of John. I guess you might even call it textual or topical style sermons. This is going to be a little bit more of a topical from the text. It's hybrid between the two. But I want to focus on something that's, that's on everybody's minds right now, and that's the word worship. Uh, everybody that would be a, a Christian who's going through these difficult times. It's been a subject that has caused great controversy controversy throughout the years, the subject of worship, and there are many different mindsets, many different ideas in the minds of people when it comes to this idea of worship, what it really means, what it looks like. I mean, you just take, for instance, uh, things from the past, things from history that we see from ancient cultures and how they treated worship and their idea of, of worship, what it would look like to them versus what we're striving to do many times today. It's also interesting if you were to go and do a Google image search or Bing image search and, and look for the word worship, just a picture of what worship looks like. If you do the same thing with the word concert, you're going to get very similar pictures. You might not be able to tell the difference between the two. Is that what worship is supposed to look like? Is that what worship really is? Does it really matter even? And so that's what we want to focus on in our study from John chapter 4 this evening. There are few, in a few cases, this word that was translated uh, worship in our English text, the word proskuneo, it, it means to bow before a superior. A couple of passages on that note, if you would, hold your place there in John chapter 4. We go to Matthew chapter 19. No, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 9, rather. Matthew chapter 9, verse 18. Matthew chapter 9, and let's look at verse 18 and see how this word is used in the text. Again, I'll be reading from the King James Version. It says, While he spake these things unto them, behold, there came a certain ruler and worshipped him. See, there's that word Worship proskuneo. He worshiped him, saying, My daughter is even now dead, but come and lay thy hand upon her, and she shall live. He worshiped, but in, in a sense here of a bowing before a superior. This man understood what it was like to, to have those people bow down to him, and he was bowing down to Jesus in that sense of a superior, being in the presence of a superior. He didn't realize totally how superior this one was. But another passage, uh, Matthew chapter 20, Matthew chapter 20, look at verse 20. It says, Then came unto him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. So this is that idea again of bowing down to in a sense of reverence and respect for someone who is in a superior position. The New Testament influenced by this, uh, is influenced by this use of proskuneo to translate a Hebrew word into proskuneo to describe worship properly given to God alone. Now these ideas are what we're looking at now from John chapter 4 verses 20 through 24. Worshiping God alone. We can bow down and worship things. We can bow down and worship as this uh, lexicon was talking about, as Macaulay was talking about, we just read. You can bow down and worship things or, or a person who's in a higher position. Refer to him even as Lord. But what we're talking about in this text in John chapter 4 is different. It's more of that idea of giving worship and describing worship that is given to God alone, focused on God Ultimately, And so the Bible talks about different kinds of worship, and we see through the text, we've already noted that a little bit, but a little bit more in specifics. What about Matthew chapter 15 and verse 9? Jesus said, In vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. In what? In vain. So there's a vain worship. That means it's an empty and a useless worship. It has no benefit whatsoever to the one being worshipped, nor for the one doing the worshiping. It's just void of any meaning. It's vain. 
Also, we read about Colossians 2 and verse 23, will worship. Will worship is a worship that's according to my will. The one who's doing the worshiping, he's doing it the way he wants. It has a show of wisdom, has a show of honor, has a show of worship, but it's will worship. It may look like it's worship, but inwardly it's, it's focused on the wrong subject matter. It's focused upon self. And so that's not a good worship. Another worship we see in the New Testament is Acts chapter 17, verse 23, where Paul was in Athens and he's beholding all of the images and he saw the one that had the inscription to the unknown God. He said they ignorantly worshiped him, this unknown God. They worshiped out of ignorance. They were just not wanting to miss one. They had gods for everything there in Athens. And so just in case they missed one, they had this altar to the unknown God. That's ignorant worship. Ignorance, and not, not meaning something disrespectful, it just means they're unlearned. They haven't studied this. They don't know this God. And he wants to introduce them to Jehovah God, who is displayed and brought forth and magnified before us through Jesus the Christ. In the beginning was the Word we talked about a couple of weeks ago. And so then there's that final one. And that's the one we want to talk about tonight. The worship that is in spirit and in truth that we read about John chapter 4, specifically John 4, 23 and 24. And so to do so, I want us to consider a conversation that Jesus had with a woman, an unlikely pupil, the Samaritan woman at the well, chapter 4 of the book of John. And so I hope again you have your Bibles ready. Now, Jesus began this simple uh, conversation. He began with a simple request. He asked her for water, something to drink. In verse uh, one of chapter four, it says, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus had ba made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples, the disciples were doing the baptiz baptizing. He was, he was the one doing the teaching. And so nevertheless, he had baptized more. He had more people following him. More people were coming to his teaching and his doctrine than did John. And so this brought the attention of the Pharisees. So he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. Note verse 4, though, it says, and he must needs go through Samaria, must needs go through Samaria. This was something that was important to Jesus. I need to do this. Why? I'm going to teach something. I'm going to show you, you Jews something, even his disciples specifically. So he cared about people. We see that. But as you go down to verse 7, we see how this conversation began. He was weary. He came by this well, the well, of course. Well, let's read up to it. In fact, John chapter 4, verse 5. Then cometh he to the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob, we can read about that in Genesis 33. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and was about, it was about the sixth hour. Then cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink. Give me something to drink. Give me some water. Now, leading up to this, again, you have the setting, but something that we may read through quickly that I want to focus on. Jesus was weary. He was human. Yes, he was 100% human, 100% God. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, we talked about. But he also was flesh, the Son of Man. And he felt the pains of the physical getting tired and weary. So he sits down by a well. Now this wasn't by chance. Remember, he must needs go through Samaria. And he picked this spot. And this woman comes to draw water, which was common practice for the woman to come and draw water. But he asks a simple request of her, give me drink. Give me drink. It goes into a discussion then about worship from that point on. Now, I know there's some things, and we'll talk about some of those things as we lead up to it, but he gets down to that worship that is in spirit and in truth, verses 23 and 24 of the text. And so bringing it around to the end, you go over to verses 39 through 42, the result of this encounter brought a woman to the truth, and she led a whole town of Samaritans to the word of God. She led the whole town to them, to Jesus, and he taught them. He cared about people, and that's something we need to understand. That's, if you don't get uh, other things from this introduction and laying the groundwork for this, make sure we hear this. Jesus went to a woman, and that was a taboo in the first place, and spoke to this woman and that culture in that day and age, but he spoke to a Samaritan woman. A woman that his other apostles, his disciples, his, the, the fellow Jews, they wouldn't have given her the time of day. They wouldn't have talked to her. 
but he speaks to her. He asks her of a, a drink of water, and, and she's a little confused by that. His disciples had gone away to buy food because they were all weary. They were all hungry. He's there alone. The woman said, verse 9 says, Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou being a Jew askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For Jews, note it, have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus says, I'm, I'm, I'm going to teach you a better way. I'm going to show you something different. Jesus came to seek and save the lost of all nations, not just the Jews, Jew first and then also the Gentile. But he was concerned about souls and he's going to teach a powerful message here. And so we, let's, let's go into this now and see what takes place and how this worship in spirit and in truth is supposed to look, what worship is supposed to truly be about. So to do this, the worship Jesus taught is going to begin with God. The worship that Jesus taught is offered in spirit, and the worship that Jesus taught is according to truth. Well, I believe we'll see all of those things play out as we go into this great study in this great chapter. First, let's begin with worship begins with God. Worship must always begin with God. One famous denominational preacher was quoted as making this statement, and I thought it was quite interesting. He said, most people think of church... And he, of course, he would be using that term as worship. Most people think of church as, as a drama, as a drama. The minister is the chief actor, God is the prompter, and the laity as the critic. He said, what actually is the case? Now, again, remember, this is a denominational preacher. These are some terms maybe that you're not familiar with. What do you mean by a chief actor? Well, he's the one putting on the show. The minister's putting on a show for everybody. God is the prompter. God's like the, the one holding up the cue cards. Here's what you say. Here's what you say. But then the laity, laity would be, as the denominational world views it, as a pastor laity and cler uh, clergy laity, which is not really necessarily a biblical terminology, this idea that, that a preacher is elevated above in that sense. But nevertheless, the laity is just the common folks, and the audience per se. But listen to what he goes on to say. Now, now having all of that painted picture in your mind, that's what many people view church, or as he said, worship as. He said what is actually the case is that the congregation is the chief actor. The minister is the prompter and God is the critic. Now, I agree with that. When we come together, when we worship God, when we assemble in our church buildings as, as one day we're going to very soon, Lord willing, as we are assembling right now to study God's word together, our focus must be on God. First and foremost, God comes first. We're either worshiping God or we're worshiping self. And if you're worshiping self, you're worshiping Satan. If you're worshiping Satan, anything else other than God, if he's not the primary focus we're failing in this. It must begin with God. And so Jesus instructed the Samaritan woman where the focus should truly be. He shows us this in the text. Now, as you continue reading, he asked, she asked him this question about being a Samaritan. Verse 10, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knowest the gift of God and who it is that saith unto thee, Give me drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. He says, If you only knew who's talking to you right now. You're, you're asking about why is a Jew talking to a Samaritan woman? If you knew who was in front of you right now, you'd be asking him of living water. So the woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with. The well is deep. She's thinking physically. Remember we talked last Wednesday night about Nicodemus and how he was on the physical mindset too about the new birth of being born again. And so he sees she didn't get it. You don't have anything to draw with. How are you going to give me living water? How's, how are you going to draw anything? Verse 12, thou art greater than our, art thou greater than our, our father Jacob, which gave us this well? Not only does she go physically, she goes to back to her heritage as well. The relationship that has been handed down from generation to generation, she goes all the way back to Jacob. Are you, are you greater than him, our father Jacob? He gave us this well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle. Oh, this is a special place. Don't you know that, Jesus? But then Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. Now he appeals to her physical sense. She understood that. I've been to this, she no doubt she'd been to that well many times and has to keep going back because you're going you're gonna to get thirsty again. 
He says, verse 14, But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman says, give me this water. Oh, he, she's intrigued now. Give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. She says, not only do I want this water so I don't get thirsty again, I, I'm tired of coming and getting water at this well. Give me this water. And so Jesus said, go and call thy husband to come hither. Uh, the woman answered, I have no husband. I wonder if she kind of turned her head a little bit at him at that one. I have no husband. And he, Jesus said unto her, thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands, and whom thou now hast is not thy husband, and that saidest thou truly. You said you don't have a husband. You spoke the truth on that. You have had five husbands and you're with one right now and he's not your husband, biblically speaking. So what does she do? She changes the subject. Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. He's, he's pointing to her. He's getting her back to what really matters. Let's get our focus where it needs to be. Get off this physical and let's start focusing on spiritual things. And to do that, to do that, the only, and I want to emphasize this, the only miracle that we see taking place in this was the miraculous knowledge that Jesus had of this woman having not met her. Everything else is based on the teaching of his word and, and the bringing about the reasoning together from the scripture. So, so she's caught up in this uh, place where they're at. She's caught up in this idea. So she's changing the subject now. After she sees he's a prophet, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Verse 20 says, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, Mount Gerizim, and ye say that Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship, you being the Jews. Which is it? So what is she doing? Jesus instructed her to focus, get the real focus of worship, get the real focus where it needs to be. And she's caught up with the where more than the who of worship. The who is more important than the where is what Jesus is going to tell her in this. Her ancestors, she wanted to know, is, is it right? Is this is what I've been taught all of my life, what my ancestors have handed down, is this the truth or is what the Jews, what the Jews are teaching, is this the truth or is what the Samaritans teach is the truth? Jerusalem or Mount Gerizim? Which one is it, Jesus? So if you go back and Carson in his commentary said, under the eschatological conditions of the drawing out, the dawning hour, let me get my words straight here. The eschatological conditions of the dawning hour, the true worshipers cannot be identified by their attachment to a particular shrine, but by their worship of the Father noted in spirit and in truth. That's what he's going to say in verse 24. In spirit and in truth. And so it's, what is Carson saying? Carson's saying, this current day that Jesus was talking about, woman, the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers, if he's saying true worshipers, it also implies that there's an untrue worship. To have pure religion, James chapter 1 tells us, verse 25, implies that there's an impure religion. To say true worship implies that there's an in, untrue worship, like the will worship or the, the vain worship, those kind of worships we talked about in the outset of the study. And so, Another commentary says, after in a, in, uh, incorrectly describing the Samaritan worship in Gerizim and the Jews worship in Jerusalem to picking the right denomination, there's some people look at it that way saying, well, you know, you go to this denomination, I go to that denomination. Does it matter which denomination? Are we going to ask Jesus which denomination matters? Bocart rightly noted, the model of Jesus is thus very instructive. He turned the conversation away from the place of worship to the nature of worship, from the place of worship to the nature of worship. So in doing this, he modeled a correct evangelical perspective. He modeled a correct evangelistic, if you will, perspective. The idea of, of reaching out and converting from worldliness to true Christianity, reaching out and drawing people not to ourselves and our group and our way, but drawing them to God's way, the truth of God's word. She's wanting to know, is it the Samaritan way or is it the Jewish way? He says, no, it's God's way. It's God's way that matters. 
What are we talking about? We're talking about a problem, a problem of who's right and who's wrong. That's where most of our discussions tend to, to be when we start talking about things like this. Who's right and who's wrong? Instead of getting to the crux of the matter and what's right and what's wrong. That's where we should be. And if we don't do that, we'll continue to have problems and those problems are going to affect our evangelism as well. John 8:32. The truth is what's going to make us free, not our opinions, not our, our organizations and our groups. One denomination is as good as another denomination. That's true. But we need to go back before denominationalism and be pre-denominal. We need to do what God says, have our focus on God. We said we were talking about worship. Yes, because worship is one of the first things that people see and when they come to an assembly, as it were, when they, they darken our doors. They, that's one of the first things they see is how we worship. Does it measure up with God? Is it focusing on God or is it focusing on me? Are we looking at our religion as a religion of what do I get out of it or what can I give to my God? What can I truly give to God? So how one worship is to be the standard um, not the geographic site per se. Are we more concerned about, think about this, are we more concerned about our family traditions, our feelings, than we are focusing upon the creator of all things when we come to worship? Do, do we stop and we think about how that feels, how that sounds, how that's, all of those, those physical things, or are we focused on God be praised God be glorified. I want this gift that I give to God, my proskuneo, my bowing before the one who is superior to me, my kissing the hand as it were of, I want him to be praised. I want him to be pleased with the gift that I bring. How one worships is to be the standard, not the geographic sight. How one worships. Jesus told the Samaritan woman, that it is uh, in this appointed time, this appointed time that he said they were in, this appointed time, true worshipers will worship the Father. Look at verse 23. This is John chapter 4, verse 23. He says, But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. I submit to you that God has always, always expected worship to be in spirit and in truth. He's always expected that of his people. To love God, you think back to the, the greatest commands, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, with all your strength. You're to teach that to your children, Deuteronomy 6. And so when we're focusing on that kind of a love toward Him, it's going to affect our worship as well. But also the truth of the matter, the truth of that worship is going to play into it as well. So God's always sought worship to be in spirit and in truth. But I want you to think about this. I want you to think about something that was said in there. And those who've heard me preach regularly, you've heard me emphasize this, but I want to emphasize it once more because it bears repetition. Something that we read over quickly in that verse that we must focus on. He seeks such to worship him. He is seeking that God himself is looking for, longing for you and I to worship him in spirit and in truth. If we truly love him, if we truly love the Lord or anyone for that matter, would we seek to give them what we want or what they desire? That's a fair question, isn't it? We would research, we would look for opportunities, maybe even hints along the way to let me know what, what it is I can do for you that will bring you joy, that will bring you happiness. I want to do that if I truly love that person. If we truly love God, it's going to be the same way. It's not going to be, we're not going to be looking for what do I get out of this gift. We're not going to be looking for how does this, how does this make me feel the only way I'm going to truly feel blessed in that worship is if I know my God is pleased with that worship. Jesus would latter say, we mentioned recently, if you love me, keep my commandments, John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. No. Let, let this, Jesus let this Samaritan woman, let's let this sink in. Jesus let this Samaritan woman know the object of true worship is the Father. The object of true worship is what matters most, not the location, the specific destination. No, the specific disposition. The specific disposition that is spirit and in truth. So when we, when we come together, when we worship on the Lord's day, when we bring our, our collective together as, a, as one body, 
praising God in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, Colossians 3, 16, and 17, Ephesians 5, 19, giving of our means, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2, or, or partaking of the Lord's Supper every first day of the week, Acts 20 and verse 7, or praying and, and preaching the Word, teaching the Word, and all of those things that go along with New Testament Christianity. When we do those things, are we doing it to bring glory and honor to God? Are we bringing the Father the worship that He not only deserves, but the worship that He seeks? It's a question that God can answer, and only you can answer for yourself. Only I can answer for myself. Are we preparing our minds to focus on the one that truly matters? So true worship, the worship of God that's in spirit and in truth, it focuses first and foremost on God. But then number two, worship must be in spirit. Worship must be in spirit. Now, there's a cynical philosopher who once proclaimed, scratch a Christian and you'll find a pagan. He was very cynical on that. You scratch a Christian, you'll find a pagan. If you, if you dig just a, a, just a little under the surface, as the idea was, there's truly a pagan there. And he may have been true in many cases, but he better not be true in mine. He shouldn't be true in yours. From our very core, we should be Christians from the very core outward. Christians from the inside out was a lesson we had not too long ago. But by the time Jesus, by the time the Word was made flesh, John 1 verse 14, by the, time, by the time the Word was made flesh, the majority of religion adherents had become more of a ritualistic system of merit and not a heartfelt appreciation for the one who God is and for the, one, for the, for the things that He has done. Matter of fact, if you think about it this way, in a lot of ways, the Jews had taken the kingdom, as it were, away from God. And Jesus is coming preaching, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's taking it back from them. Think about what they were doing to Jesus when they would say, your disciples, they transgressed the law. No, they transgress our traditions or they transgress these, these things that we've set forth and they're not washing their hands before they eat or they're violating the Sabbath law because they plucked a few ear, ears of grain from as they were walking through the fields, which actually was in, in line with God's word, in line with the law of Moses even. But nevertheless, they had turned it into some ritualistic system and made things much harder on the people than God ever had. But nevertheless, the idea still holds true. They're focusing on these rituals and, and checking boxes idea of religion. And many of us can be guilty of the same thing if we're not careful. That our worship has become cold and ritualistic and it gives the cynic the same idea that, that one said, you scratch them a little bit and you'll see a pagan just checking boxes. Are we worshiping out of duty? Or are we worshiping out of love? And that's a serious question. Love for God. So Jesus, he gives attention to this word spirit in this context. His attention to spirit in the context seems to be showing a contrast from the vain worship that had been going on, or the vain worshiper, let me say it that way, who's merely going through the motions, and a true worshiper whose attitude is connected completely to his actions. Remember, Jesus taught the Samaritan woman that true worship was not about the location. We noted that already in verse 21 nor could it be offered without divine direction. Look at verse 22. Verse 22, it says, Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship. He being the Samaritans, we being the Jews. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. What did he mean by that? That we're better than you? No, that the word was, the word was supposed to be directing the Jews. They knew where salvation originated. And so he's letting her know that as well. So we consider this idea. He goes on to say that it must be therefore in spirit and in truth. In spirit and in truth. So first and foremost, it wasn't about the location, verse 21. It was about divine direction, verse 22. Therefore it must be in spirit and in truth. Our, our worship is supposed to expose that which is unseen on the inside of each one of us. What is that? Spirit. The spirit, the attitude and the disposition. It should expose that. It should be brought to light. Consider what gets in the way of true worship in spirit. Think about it. Of course, one would say, if you'll sum it up, sin. Sin's the one thing, the main thing that gets in the way. That's true. But what about with that Samaritan woman? It seemed that she tried to sub, uh, change the subject when the sinful material of her marital status is brought to light. And that's back to verses 16 through 20. You have five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. Uh, let's change the subject. 
many want to do that today. Oh, let's not talk about those things. Let's move on from that. But that, that gets in the way, doesn't it? Sometimes our, the sinful material uh, in our lives, it gets in our way when it starts being brought up, starts getting on our toes is the saying where we, want to, we just want to change gears and I'm not going to be able to worship in spirit. Just consider all the times we develop the disposition of anger or at least seek to change the subject when someone shines the light of truth on our sins. It shouldn't be the case. We need to repent of those things. Ask, is it true? Another hindrance to the Samaritan was her heritage. We noted that in verse 20. Her her Our fathers said this mountain, Mount Gerizim. Jews are over here in Jerusalem. Which one is it? Am I supposed to go against my ancestry? Am I supposed to go against my family? Well, Jesus said sometimes that's going to be the case. Matthew 10, 35 through 36. He came to set a man at variance, at, at odds with the family. And it wasn't his goal. That wasn't what he wants. But the truth is going to do that. Truth is always going to do that. It's going to separate those who are, who are focused on God, who are in, serious about being Christians. It's going to separate us from the world. Sometimes that world has creeped into our families. And Satan knows what he's doing. And it's going to cause a division between us. So family has caused far too many to lose they or choose rather a religion of convenience over one of true faith and conviction. So therefore, on the Lord's day, we're preparing what we're going to wear and all those other less significant things, not saying they're not important at all, but less significant things. They, we stress over those things. We must never forget to prepare our hearts, to prepare our spirit, to prepare our attitude to stand, as it were, before the creator of all the universe, the creator of heaven and earth. If not, we cannot hope to worship him in spirit. Jesus said God seeks such to worship him in spirit, also in truth. Worship must, that's number three, worship must be in truth. So it has to be focused on God. It must be in spirit and it must be in truth. God always gives instruction. He always has, always will give instruction on how his will is going to be done here on this earth, including how we worship him in spirit. You go back to the very beginning, Cain and Abel, as we see them worshiping in Genesis chapter 4. We know from the Hebrew account, Hebrews chapter 11, that by faith Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice than did Cain his brother. By faith. How did he offer by faith? He did that which was told him. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. What about Noah? Genesis chapter 6, the very last verse of the chapter, thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him, so did he. That's the point. He told him how. He told him what. Noah did it. Noah did it. Nadab and Abihu, Leviticus chapter 10, they offered strange fire which the Lord commanded them not. He never gave them a command to use the fire that they used. He gave them a command to use what they were supposed to. They went against that and thus fire came from heaven and consumed them. The Lord gives instruction and in the Lord's instruction back in John chapter 4 to this Samaritan woman, he tied these two things, spirit and truth together with equal importance. And a coordinating conjunction tying two things of equal value together, spirit and truth. They're connected. We're not separating those. Back to one commentary, he says, No one can genuinely know God, no, no one genuinely knows God's God except those. Let me start over, please. No one genuinely knows God except through some form of revelatory encounter. His revelation to us. But such encounters should be enlightened through written or oracle articulations in order that such encounters become defined to humans and not remain subjective experiences. Now think about what that author said. Subjective experiences. That's what has been spouted and been taught and been promoted for so many years in religious circles, a better felt than told experience. Notice again, subjective experiences. There's no proof behind, there's no standard behind that. It is the combination of those two elements that one can sense the point being made here, namely that acceptable worship involves verse, uh, both spirit and truth. Acceptable worship involves both spirit and truth. We must not overlook, another author says, we must not overlook the close connection of spirit and truth as in an ideal unity, not union, unity on the same page. It implies that one cannot exist without the other. 
You cannot have true worship in spirit alone. You cannot have true worship in truth alone. True worship must combine the two, unified spirit and in truth, if it's going to be true worship. Jesus was asked, likely in a condescending way on one occasion when he was standing before Pilate, Luke, John chapter 18, verse 38, the Pilate asked him, what is truth? What is truth? Truth was standing right before him. But we have a fitting answer. We have an answer through the prayer of Jesus himself, John chapter 17. Most cases, truth seems to be easily understood as something uh, that's not a lie. But, but the Word of God tells us what the truth is. It is the Word of God. John 17, verse 17, Jesus prayed for his disciples, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy Word is truth. And it is truth. I can be wrong. I have been wrong and I will probably be wrong again. No doubt about it. But the Word of God will always be right. It will always be truth. The truth of God's Word has always been the standard by which anyone can serve God faithfully. The truth of God has to be the standard. I mean, you stop and you think. If it is just some subjective experience or some better felt than told experience, how can we know that that's even the case? Many people have gone away from this idea of absolute truth. We don't like that terminology. There's no such thing as absolute truth. And as the old saying goes, they're absolutely sure of that. But faith is the result of hearing God's word. We've already noted Romans 10, 17. But, but look back to this account again. Remember we noted that only miracle that was taking place in this situation was the miraculous knowledge that Jesus had of this Samaritan woman having never met her. But I want you to read with me a few more verses and we'll start bringing this to a close. Chapter 4, John chapter 4, verses 39 through 42. John chapter 4, 39 says, And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified, He told me all that I ever did. She went back to her city. She went back to her town, brought the people. I have met a man who told me all of my history. She told me, he told me all about myself. And you need to come here. And this is the one. This is the one we've heard about. They believed her based on the word that she said of what Jesus did. But keep reading. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them. And he abode there two days. And many more believed, notice, because of the miracles that he did. No, many more believed because of his own words. Because of his own word. And said unto the woman, Now we believe not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. They believed, why? Because of his word. What is the standard for what we practice in our worship today? Is it the word of God? Is it the truth of God's word? Or is it the opinions that we have, the things that have been handed down from generation to generation? Are we listening to culture rather than the creator? Are we listening to the world rather than the word? Are we willing to worship God in spirit and in truth? You see, God is still seeking today those people who will worship him with the right frame of mind, with the right spirit, the right disposition. And he's still seeking those who are willing to worship him according to the word of God, the word of truth. When we're sanctified by the word of truth, we're going to show that word of truth in our lives, even in our worship today. Hearing the word of God that gives us faith is what motivates us to act upon the actions that God teaches us in his word, including in our worship, but also to repent of our sins as is commanded all men everywhere, Acts 17 verse 30. We confess what we believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God, Romans 10 verse 10, and we're baptized into Christ for the remission of our sins. Acts 2 38, Peter was telling those people on the day of Pentecost, they asked, what shall we do? He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Jesus, the one who's telling this woman how to worship, the one who's telling this woman that the focus must be on God, the worship must be in spirit, the worship must be in truth. He's the one that said, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. We need to listen to him in order to find salvation. If we're going to listen to him to find salvation, will we not 
also need to listen to him and how we are going to worship the creator, the almighty God of heaven and earth, the one who's seeking my worship and yours. Worship, though it is obligated, it never needs to be viewed as an obligation to the true worshiper. It's an opportunity, a blessing for us. We're not going to view it as just some cold ritual or obligation that we must do. True worshipers know that we worship the Father, and worshiping the Father comes with having a right spirit and a right attitude because He's revealed in His Word how we can worship Him, how we can please Him, how we can be what God would have us to be, to be devoted to Him, devoted to the truth through His Word. There's no better way to worship God than spirit and in truth. Is that how you've been worshiping? Or maybe your worship's been in vain. Have you been worshiping in spirit and in truth? Or have you been worshiping according to your own will? Have you been worshiping in spirit and in truth? Or are you practicing some ignorant worship? You're just going through some motions and following what other people are doing instead of actually digging into God's Word and seeing what God would have you to do. If we could be of any assistance and any help in any way in helping you to see what God would have you to do and making sure we're doing what God would have us to do, reach out. Let us know what we can do to help. Give us a call. Message us on Facebook. Whatever we can do to assist, we want to make sure that we're worshiping God in spirit and in truth, and make sure that when we come to the end of this life, heaven will be our home. Can we assist you in any way? Let us know. Let's close this study with a word of prayer. Our God and Father, we come before thee humbled and thankful for the hope that we have in Christ Jesus, humbled and thankful for the grace that thou hast bestowed upon us, the mercy that we receive, thankful and humbled at the justice of, of thy spirit, the justice of, of how thou art holy and how that thou art gracious, how thou art going to do that which is right, and how that we must come before thy throne with humble hearts in spirit and in truth, worshiping thee, that we must come before thy throne, focusing on thee and doing what thou would have us to do to not only bring glory to thy name in this world, but help others see the peace, the joy, and the hope that we have in Christ Jesus, that they too may want to have that as well. Father, bless us in this nation as we're going through these difficult times. We pray for an end to this quarantine. We pray for an end to this dreaded virus and that we can come together again and assemble in the fellowship one with another and the fellowship with thee again. Father, we're thankful for our elders and their vigilance and their diligence in working to make sure that we are doing those things that uh, thou would have us to do, that we are truly a congregation of thy people on the straight and narrow. We pray for every member of the East Main family and every member of thy kingdom the world over. Bless and keep us all in the hollow of thine hand till we meet again. It's in Jesus' most holy name we pray. Amen. God bless.